Welcome to Intimate Fame, conversations with the famous and infamous like you have never heard. Success, love, history alive, history undressed, private lives intimately revealed. What if you were there? Now you are invited. Meet extraordinary people as you never have before. One person stories like no conversation you have ever been part of. James Dean, the ultimate symbol of rebellious youth, difficult and exposed, vulgar and sensitive, grieved and great. An actor unlike Hollywood had ever encountered, more explosive than Brando, more fragile than Clift. A rocket ablaze, a trajectory that would burst aflame tragically in but a few priceless years. Fate had other plans. September 30th, 1955, what of the last moments of his life? On that final day, in the hours, the minutes, the seconds, what of his past became present in the instant between life and death? What was in the mind of James Dean that he embraced in the final flash of existence on September 30th, 1955? Your life can flash before you in an instant. Join us for 9 30 55. Tonight, Episode 1. There's only one true form of greatness for a man. If he can bridge the gap between life and death, if he can live on after he's died, then maybe he was a great man. Whatever's the truth, you gotta live fast. September 30th, 1955, 7 a.m. My buddy Nico made it at my favorite restaurant, Villa Capri. Nico owns the place I'm renting. He stops by and wakes me up. Big day for me, and he wants to make sure I don't oversleep. I oversleep. Make coffee for the two of us, but no time for chit-chat. I am in a hurry to leave. Big race this weekend, upstate in Salinas. My fourth race, I place first in novice, second overall, Palm Springs. At Bakersfield, third, I'll tell you that race anyone was lucky to finish. Crap weather day. In Santa Barbara, started 18th, got to fourth. At the fifth lap, blew a damn piston. Awarded DNF. Those were all in my Porsche 365 Speedster. This one in Salinas is with my new port, the 550 Spider. This is a real race car. We know we can win. I pretty much take what I'm wearing in my racing gear. Seven thirty-five a.m. I ask Nico to lock up and I jump into my 1955 Ford County Squire station wagon. Kind of a dumbass car for me, but I need it for sport car towing. My plan all along has been we put my new race car on the trailer and tow it up to Salinas with the Ford County Squire. But two nights before, at dinner at the Villa Capri with everybody going to the race, I really wanted to drive it up so I can get a better feel for the car. I have to run it. I, I have to know it. Everybody wants to tow it that I need rest for the race? Like I'm 30 or something. I want, more than anything, my buddy Lou to ride with me. He wants it towed. I beg. He says if I'm going to drive it, I gotta drive it behind the station wagon and trailer. I say, no way! Who the hell wants to drive a Spider 550 behind a station wagon? Says I should do what he says for safety. I'm safe enough. Rolf backs me up. He gave me the idea to drive the spider up the day before. We have 300 miles to Salinas. Great chance to break it in. I'd been filming Giant and no real chance to race it, even through the Hollywood Hills. Mulholland Drive, I'd turn into my own personal racetrack, clocking in at over 600 miles in my old car. Nothing with my spider. So uh, I get my way. I mean, come on, it's my $7,000 car. Bill and Sanford will follow, towing the empty trailer. After the race, we'll load the spider onto the trailer and drive home together in the County Squire station wagon. Seven forty a.m., Nico wishes me a safe race. I'm living in Sherman Oaks, and I have to drive to Hollywood for the car. Ventura Boulevard, over Quango Pass, into Hollywood. Competition Motors... 1219 North Fine Street. Park in a side lot. Next to the race car trailer loaned to me by a Cal Club member. (music) 
8 a.m. Rolf Witherich is already working under the hood of the spider. A couple days earlier, I took the car down to Dean Jeffrey's shop for painting the race car number 130 on the side and hood and trunk. And, of course, to have some fun. There was something I wanted inscribed on the back. Jack Warner started calling me the little bastard because I refused to move out of my East of Eden trailer after the movie was done. So, I had Dean paint it. The little bastard in cold, black, non-removable script-style lettering all the way across the damn rear. Every time Mr. Warner saw me in the car on the street, a studio lot, a newspaper photograph, I wanted him to know how much I truly appreciated him thinking about me at all. Rolf is driving with me to Salinas to be my race car mechanic. The only reason I own the car at all is because of Rolf. Competition Motors wasn't going to sell it to me. They thought I needed more race experience. And they sure as hell knew the studios weren't going to be happy about it. Rolf told his bosses he would personally take care of the car and go to all races with me. Nine oh five. If it can be possible, Rolf is more excited about the race than me and wants us both on the road ASAP. He lives a few blocks away and has come in most likely at sunrise to replace the oil and transmission fluid. By the time I get there, he's working on the valves. The man, I tell you, is a world-class mechanic. I know I'm in good hands. I, I want to help. Rolf is from Germany, comes here to work on imported race cars for the Hollywood set. I get lucky that he's in my corner. He takes a liking to me because I seem more serious about the race than the most. His English, not so great, but he is clear enough to tell me when he needs to keep my damn fingers to myself and let him work. He still has spark plugs, a ridiculously complicated dual ignition timing, and even more ridiculously complicated twin Solex 40 PJJ carburetors air fuel mixture. I tell him it's a waste of time, but he insists on installing a safety belt. Just one for me, for the race. Rolf needs three, maybe four more hours. Sanford Roth and Bill Hickman show up. Both buddies have met him filming Giant. Sanford is a photographer, met in Marfa, Texas, location shoot. Some of the best production shots ever done of me. He talks Collier's magazine into doing a photo article about me and racing. So he is riding along in the Ford County Squire station wagon to photograph me and Salinas. Bill is an actor, friend, and a crazy-ass great stunt driver. Truth be told, I, I think everyone knows Bill Hickman is a far better crazy-ass stunt driver than he is an actor, but we can keep that between us. I need a damn good driver to handle the station wagon and the hitched-up trailer. Bill jumps at the chance. Ten thirty a.m. My dad, who I never see, and I'm pretty sure never wants to see me, my dad and my uncle show up to see the spider. Dad doesn't give a damn that I'm famous, doesn't give a damn about anything around me. It's to impress his brother, Uncle Charlie. 11.15 a.m. Rolf has a present for me. He gives me a bed. Not just any old bed. This is a Cloisson Newburgring badge he received as a pork mechanic at the 1954 Newburgring 1,000km endurance race. He mounts it on the driver's side, just in front of my door. So cool. 11.30am, Rolf is still under the hood. I'm pacing. I can't even see Rolf's face, but I know I'm driving him crazy. I'm chain-smoking, as usual. There's a smoke in my mouth 24-7. Stuff is gonna kill me for sure, but... What the hell? Something is gonna kill all of us, right? We got time. We go across the street to Hollywood Ranch Market. Donuts and coffee. I got no money on me. 
Dad gives me $35. I pay for coffee and donuts all around and pocket the change for the road. 12.30 p.m., Rolf is done. I back the spider out of the garage and into the side lot. Pose for some photos Sanford wants to take next to Rolf's badge. p.m., I take Dad and Uncle Charlie for a fast spin. It's getting hot. Gonna be a scorcher of a day on the drive north. I ditch the black sweater for a long-sleeve white pullover. 1.15 p.m. Time to say goodbye. I call Lou Bracker, my best buddy in Hollywood. Okay, driver. Better buddy. It was Lou who called me when he drove by Competition Motors and saw the spider in the showroom window, and I went straight over to see it. I'd already asked, but I asked again if he wants to come along. Last chance. Lou is going to the USC Texas football game. Tells me good luck and have a great time. Tells me try to learn how to handle the car. I tell him, this is going to be different. We're going to win. But I can't get him to give up his football game. Okay, I tell him. It's your funeral. Lou didn't think it was funny. 1.30 p.m., Rolf hitches the trailer to the Ford County Squire. One last picture before we head out. Rolf and me, sitting in the spider, holding hands, raised up together in victory. We are gonna win. One fifty p.m., we head north on Vine. Back over Coenga Pass, west on Ventura Boulevard. Bill and Sanford follow in the Ford County Squire and the empty trailer. Bill and Sanford speed up alongside of us, which is pretty funny to watch given I'm in my expensive sports car and they're in my piece of shit station wagon. But Sanford has a hard on to take a shot of us. The only reason they even catch us is because I'm a good boy and I'm staying at the Los Angeles speed limits. I can't afford a ticket. I gotta be somewhere. I'm James Dean driving the sexiest race car ever in Hollywood. I'm bringing enough attention to myself. I give Sanford his moment in the sun because once we get over into the California Central Valley, the boondocks, I'm gonna run this little bastard hard, real hard, with no photo ops. Our cars are driving side by side. Sanford fires away. I got the feeling it's gonna be a great shot. I'm not even looking at him. Like, yeah, I'm James Dean in the hottest race car ever, and I'm not gonna acknowledge you're there. I'm just going to smoke my cig and drive. I can see out of the corner of my eye Rolf is looking directly at Sanford with this cool as hell smile. Look at me. I'm riding with fucking James Dean. 2.15 p.m. He is killing us already. Not even out of the San Fernando Valley. I'm down to a white v-neck t-shirt. Rolf's got on a red and black checkered shirt and didn't bring nothing else, so he rolls up his sleeves. Rolf forgot his sunglasses. He's gonna be blind by Bakersfield. 2.30 p.m., we stop for gas. Sanford and Bill catch up. One more picture. Me putting on my brown leather racing gloves for the road to Salinas. I tell Sanford, okay, that's it. I know you're here for shooting shots, but the only picture you haven't shot is me taking a piss. We turn out to Sepulveda Boulevard, then Route 99 and Newhall, heading to what they call the Grapevine, and then the big, damn-ass San Joaquin Valley. 3.30 p.m., north on Route 99. Kern County is flat. Flatter than flat. Heading for the flattest of all flat places. Bakersfield. We come up on Wheeler Ridge, and I can't be too surprised I was speeding. Had been since Newall. Cop pulls us over for doing 65 and a 55. 
I'm sure I was doing 80, but caught is caught. Officer Odie Valero, Hunter, pulls us over. Not just us, but Sanford and Bill as well. Got him for doing more than 45 with a trailer. Two for one. Officer Hunter misspelled my middle name. Byron into Byron? We talked about the race in Salinas. Asks about my car. Never seen anything like it. Asks if I'm employed. I tell him Warner Brothers in Burbank. Officer Hunter has no idea who I am. p.m., we decide to take the race route. I hear some of the drivers talk about Bakersfield. 25 mile per hour zones, stoplights every intersection. Stay out of it. Race a route, you can drive fast. We turn left on Route 99 at Mettler Station, then onto Route 166. At Maricopa, we turn right onto Route 33 towards Taft. Another 40 miles to Fellows and McKettrick. There is nothing out in these old parts. Cattle, More cattle. Some oil rigs looking like they're not doing much oil. Sure as heck no officer hunters. I decide what the hell. Let's see what the little bastard's made of. I slam into fourth gear. Rolf is giving me the evil eye that maybe I should be a good boy. Like I said I would, but before he can bring himself to say what he's thinking, we're over 90 miles an hour. Tack registers at 6,000 to 6,500 RPM. We're a damn space rocket. A hundred miles an hour. Rolf is yelling in my ear between the wind and the engine. I can't hear him, but I got a pretty good idea what he's going on about. A hundred and twenty-five miles an hour. I've made my point. The little bastard can do what I was betting on. I take my foot off the pedal and we fly like some silent eagle. One hundred miles per hour. 90, 80, 60. Heading toward the 33 and 466 junction. Blackwell's Corner. (laughs) 5 p.m. A dusty Richfield gas station with Something of a snack store seems a good place to stop for a break. Get some water, an apple or something. Wait for Sanford and Bill to catch up. Gotta be in the 90s by now. We got no root. Our heads are frying. Be a while before the sun is down. Pulling up, I see a race car I'm familiar with parked at the gas pumps. A dark blue MB 300 SL Gullwing Coupe. I know the two boys from the other races. Lance and Bruce. Younger than me. I don't know for sure, but I have the feeling they are two rich boys from Beverly Hills or the Palisades, because that 300 SL is not a cheap driving machine. We talk about the race. I don't say it out loud, but these boys do not have a chance in hell of winning. Oh, they'll turn some heads with that beauty of a car, and the fact that boys are pretty, but they have got nothing on the little bastard. Turns out Officer Hunter made a go for them as well. Lance and Bruce saw Officer Hunter first and pulled over, pretending car trouble. Officer Hunter just drives by. We make dinner plans for when we all reach Paso Robles, about 60 miles down the road. Five ten p.m. Bill and Sanford catch up and pull into Blackwell's corner. Bill is on me before he's out of the station wagon, yelling, I need to slow down. Don't run wild. Big difference between the old 1500 and this new spider. Feel your way. I try the I'll be a good boy routine, but he's not buying it. He tells me, Jimmy, you got a bigger career before you than the race car you drive in. This is an argument he is never going to win. Being a movie star is nothing compared to being a race car driver. 5.20 p.m., Rolf and I are about to head out down Route 466. Paso Robles, dinner on to Salinas for the night. Race next morning. I'm wearing this ring I really like. 
I don't know why. I don't plan it or even think about it. I pull the ring off and give it the roll. Well, I don't just give it to him. I, I try and put it on his fucking finger. Like I'm marrying him or something. That gets a nervous laugh from Roll. His hands are so big and fat, the only place my damn ring will go, and it's a tight squeeze at that, is his pinky. I tell Rolf, and now it really looks like we're getting hitched. I tell him, look, Rolf, you are my guardian angel. I want you to have my ring. I give you this ring. At 5.30 p.m., Lance and Bruce tell me that the place to meet for dinner down the road in Paso Robles, and they're gone in a dust storm. p.m., Rolf comes back from the food store and we leave Blackwell's Corner. Bill and Sanford will head out and a few behind us. Country changes quickly. All that flat nothing cattle land goes to hilly on us. Very pretty and the temp is dropping fast. It's probably 90 miles to the west, but you can feel something of an open breeze. And... That's a great break from what we've had. The sun is setting in our eyes. Climb up and through the Polo Neo Pass and start a descent along the antelope grade that surprises you. No real signs to warn you. comes up fast and steep. Rolf is ducking under the dash to try to light another cigarette for me, trying to keep the flame alive. I'm asking him about oil pressure and temperature, and I'm speeding. Rolf won't let up, telling me to get together with the car. The two-lane road makes a straight line. Fast drop into the Colum Valley. Ahead, a Y intersection. Route 41 heading northeast to Fresno. Daylight going fast. Shadows everywhere. What's left of the sun is staring us right in the face. Five forty four p.m. Directly in front of me, John Robert White and his wife are driving their Pontiac sedan. They are a, a mile from the Y junction with Route 41. Mr. White is a 50-year-old public accountant with Price Waterhouse in Los Angeles. They are on their way to Washington State. I'm speeding down the antelope grade, and I misjudge the closing speed coming up on the rear of John Robert White's Pontiac. I need to pass to avoid running into it. Downshift a third to pull the little bastard out into the eastbound lane, accelerating hard to get my ass around Mr. White's boat of a Pontiac. When I pull into the passing lane, three cars are coming directly toward me. I don't see a lot. The Pontiac is so damn big. The first car is present 60. Clifford Horde is traveling with his wife and two children. Mr. Horde takes the right shoulder to avoid being sideswiped by my car that is already in his lane. I was hitting 85 or better to be sure. And I'm also sure Mr. White and his wife must have felt like they were standing still when we fly by. I catch a quick glance at them. They are truly spooked. We all know it's a crazy ass pass. At the same time, behind Mr. Horde is a 1950 black and white Ford Custom, driven by a 23-year-old college student, Donald Jean Turnupspeed. 
He's heading east on Route 466 at 60 miles an hour. Don is heading home to Tulare after finishing his Friday afternoon classes at Cal Poly in San Luis Obispo. He needs to make the left-hand turn at the Y Junction onto Route 41, something he has done on most weekends since going away to college. There is no left turn lane. He can see Mr. White's Pontiac heading west in his direction. There's plenty of time for him to make the left turn onto Route 41. Suddenly, he sees me. More precisely, he sees the silver-gray little bastard. 80, 90 miles an hour, just a bullet coming at him. He panics, spikes the brakes hard, leaves a 22-foot skid mark as his car travels across the center line. He gets off the brakes and onto the gas, hoping he can make it past me. Realizing he can't avoid the collision, he yanks the steering wheel hard right and again stomps the brakes, this time laying down 30 more feet of tire skid marks. My gut tells me not to brake and lose control of the car. Instead, throttle steer and sidestep the spider around his car. Doesn't work. Spider's low polar moment of inertia causes it to spin, counterclockwise directly into Don's Ford. p.m. Left side of my Porsche Spider 550 takes full impact. Tears apart the little bastard's tin aluminum skin. No protection for roll for me. Impact lifts Don's Ford rear wheels, sending it broad, slight, scraping up the highway for 39 feet. Ford's left front fender torn off. Chunks of wheel rims and axles hit the asphalt surface. Stop in the westbound traffic lane. Both vehicles are airborne. Landing 50 feet apart. A 3,000 pound car against a 1,300 pound aluminum hand. I'm not wearing the fucking seatbelt. My feet are crushed in the car, pinned by the clutch and pedal. I can pry and pulled out with a crowbar. Dawn climbs from his Ford. Bloody face. Forehead split open for a bit of smashing into the windshield. He's gonna live. Rolf's face is slant against the metal dashboard before being ejected. He lands on the highway shoulder ten feet away, bleeding, mouth full of broke teeth, fractured jaw, left femur twisted and shattered. His pinky finger, with his new guardian angel ring for me, is seven. Never found the ring. Or the fucking thing. Pretty messed up. He is gonna live. Crazy shit. Rolf moves back to Germany, and on the evening of July 20, 1981, leaves a bar in his hometown, loses control of his car, and slams into a house. His feet are crushed in the car, pinned by the clutch and pedal. Has to be pried out and pulled out with a crowbar. Died on impact. 53 years old. Me? I'm hanging over the driver's side door. My forehead, faith, arms, chest, apart. Neck broken. Skull cracked open. Multiple fractures in my arms and legs. Force of the crash caused my bucket seat to tear loose from its mountains. It flew out of the cockpit. When the little bastard was airborne and landed, who knows where. Five fifty-five p.m. Sanford and Bill drive up to the scene. On the ground, I'm held in the arms of my crazy-ass stunned driver buddy Bill. Sanford sobs, standing over us. I wouldn't wish that on my worst enemy. 5.30. September 30th, 1955, 6.20 p.m. I'm pronounced DOA 
at Paso Robles War Memorial Hospital. 24 years old. They say, in a heartbeat, your life can flash in front of you. That sounds like BS to me. That is until 5.44 p.m. September 30th, 1955. A day, an hour, a minute, a second. Turns out I'm wrong. Your life damn well does flash in front of you in a heartbeat. We all have a lot more to remember than we think. Join us next time for Episode 2 of 93055. Intimate Fame, created by Scott Edward Smith, 93055, written by Scott Edward Smith. James Dean, performed by Casey Hawks. Original music by Chesney Hawks. Associate producer, Melissa Job, produced by Howard Gluss. Please join us for upcoming productions of Alexander the Great, Mary Queen of Scots, Taylor and Burton, and more from Intimate Fame.